the other interesting part of biology, Johan, is the androgen receptor biology. We, you know, it's been an important part of prostate cancer therapy for as long as we've been, we've been treating it. And do you think the earlier use of AR targeted therapy will drive earlier resistance? I mean, what, what, what's your thoughts on that topic? So I think, first of all, there's clearly many different subtypes of prostate cancer with um, different risks of that resistance emerging. There's incontrovertible evidence that we are getting resistance mechanisms emerging with AR copy number gain, the gene copy gain and increased AR expression, AR mutations, AR rearrangement. So the gene is fused, rearranged, is changed so that you only express splice variants. And I suspect there's going to be other aberrations too. These are clearly going to emerge, particularly after giving abiraterone and zalutamide, next generation hormonal agents. So by giving these drugs earlier, we are going to be likely to get these resistance mechanisms earlier, particularly in cancers with that genomic instability, that intercellular intrapatient heterogeneity. And it's a concern to me that as we give these drugs earlier, you know, I'm seeing a lot of patients with modest disease volume, having had all the available treatments very early on. And it concerns me that that is not necessarily a good thing for our patients. I don't know if Bertrand, you agree with that? No, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm even worried when uh, I did recently a clinicaltrial.gov search on using AR, and even people use that in a very early, very, very early onset disease, even prevention trial. But we should keep in mind that that are extremely potent drug in terms of inducing AR re rearrangement in general. So, Johan, do you have the same concern with conventional, traditional androgen deprivation, or is it just in relation to the new drugs, the abiraterones and enzalutamides? Well, can, you know, the, the, the traditional LHRH analogues were not blocking AR signaling that well, and it's really quite, um, <laughs> it's a shame that it took us so long to figure that out. I think the concern is that in some patients, even within weeks of castration, androgen receptor splice variants are clearly emerging. Work from Martin Gleave in Vancouver and, other, and others have shown within weeks of castration you have AR splice variants. The emerging data would indicate, and we've just published a paper on this, that AR splice variants upregulate DNA repair, particularly non-homologous non joining, and that causes radiation resistance. So our current strategy of giving these drugs before radiation may be indeed being the worst thing possible to generate splice variants that cause resistance. And it's seriously a major concern until we generate other methods to uh, block non-homologous joining, for example, by inhibiting DNA PK PKC, which we've shown in our paper that if you give it DNA PKC inhibitors, you actually block that repair and you further sensitize to the radiation despite the presence of ER splice variants. On the other hand, we do have large randomized trials comparing radiation alone versus radiation plus ADT, showing significant survival benefits for the combination. The survival benefits are there, but I can assure you that they'll be even higher if we can block those splice variants and that you know, DNA um, repair process based on the data emerging. Do you think the issue is the neoadjuvant part of the hormone bit, the bit that comes before That's the radiation? That's certainly a concern. So yeah. if you give neoadjuvant hormone therapy, and many groups have shown this, and very early on, in 15% or so, you are getting those splice variants expressed very early, then radiation is less likely to work in those cancers that AR splice variant expressing and really driving that repair process that causes you know, radiation resistance. There was an RTOG phase three trial which looked at radiation plus short course hormones and they randomized between the timing of the hormones. Mm -hmm. So uh, half got neoadjuvant and half got um, subsequent ADT. And actually, the neoadjuvant strategy seems to be better em empirically. That was the evidence from RTOG 9413, That's I think right, it was. Yeah. So that makes sense because actually resistance mechanisms depend on population statistics. And the less cancer cells you have left to treat by radiation, you know, the less likely you're going to get resistance. But that does not, you know, um, denigrate the argument that actually splice variants are causing resistance. And in fact, this is, you know, this is not actually surprising. I mean, we've already shown that blocking AR increases survival. But we're not blocking ER enough, and we're, we know that. And that, that AR splice variant can emerge very early on, and this is a serious concern for our current paradigm. And what, what do we know about neuroendocrine differentiation? Um, uh, uh, is there a switch that happens? Is there a biological switch that happens with neuroendocrine differentiation? So first of all, the word neuroendocrine makes me somewhat nervous. And the reason I say this is that we have looked at over 300 metastatic castration systems and prostate cancer biopsies. And um, we've done a number of neuroendocrine markers, CD56, uh, synaptophysin, chromogranin, we've got AR down regulation, 
we looked at um, cadherin E and N, and um, we don't see much evidence of true neuroendocrine differentiation, although it does depend on how you define neuroendocrine. Yeah. And I think it'd be fair to say there is still significant confusion as to what is neuroendocrine. However, it is quite evident now, based on two important science papers from two different groups earlier this year, that actually there is evidence now that you develop RB1 loss. Uh, um, it can be uh, monoallelic or biallelic loss of RB1, and it usually follows the earlier 53 mutation and loss of function 53, and that double loss 53 in RB1 is generating this luminal to basal transition with decreased AR expression uh, and a more basal phenotype. I'm not sure we should call this neuroendocrine. I think it's a, probably a switch in, in cell phenotype, but sometimes you are correct, it does become neuroendocrine. Now what's particularly interesting here is that RB1, which is this late subclonal hit, is a gene that sits next to BRCA2. These are two closely, you know, um, I guess, uh, closely opposing genes on the, um, on the um, chromosome 13. They're a gene cassette. And in our data, we've just published in Clinical Cancer Research recently, C. Detail, we've shown that many of these cancers, in fact, the majority, lose BRCA2 and RB1 at the same time. And it's a subclonal late loss. And therefore, that explains probably why when you get this neuroendocrine, if I can call it that phenotype, we're seeing some platinum sensitivity. But it is subclonal. And when you do RB1 in immunohistochemistry, and we've done a lot of this, you see islands of RB1 loss and a lot of cells that still have RB1. So this is truly subclonal. And I mean, if you, many centers have tried to look systematically at this panel of gene and what we call Gleason 9, Gleason 10, very aggressive disease. And actually, if you look at these, high, even high risk localized disease with very, very high Gleason score, what we call neuroendocrine is many times a subset where if you simply do AR staining, they not AR, they, they don't simply express staining. And that's where you find all these aberrations. So it, the neuro, is it neuroendocrine or they, they're simply not AR dependent, which is not like lung cancer. So, but if you look at these patients and very subset, in, if you, if you, for surgeon will look at Gleason 9, you're gonna find these patients on yeah, a regular sure. basis. What's quite important for us to understand is that this is really, it's like you know, playing snooker. Yeah. You know, you can um, put all the red balls and you're left with the colored balls, mm. but that's just more complicated because if you put, put the colored balls, the red balls can come back. And Chris and I are treating a, you know, a patient who um, has getting therapy that is probably clearing his neuroendocrine BRCA2 type disease with platinum. And what's fascinating is that he had very low PSA before he got therapy. And when he gave him platinum, actually, his cancer recurred with a very high PSA. And before, it always had a low PSA, indicating that we've now cleared the kind of, you know, basal clones, neuroendocrine, if you want to call it. So, so I don't think we should call it neuroendocrine. And the more AR-driven clones come back. And that really drives the message that we have to be thinking about combination therapy.